yesterday when we had uh, closed sessions um, and we were approaching the discussion on international organizations, uh, everybody in the room was like dismissing the whole issue, laughing like, why do we need to discuss international organizations? They fail in the Middle East. They don't do anything meaningful in the Middle East, right? So we could, you know, get rid of them altogether and, you know, deal with the, with the, with the crisis in Syria and elsewhere on, the, on a bilateral. Um, God. But uh, still, it, it, it was surprising to me that, you know, international organizations are dismissed that way, not only at a state level, but also at the level of experts, you know, the people who, could, who should rationalize and, you know, come up with rational and pragmatic ideas, and you see experts from all over the world dismissing the role of international organizations in the Middle East. That's quite tragic, you know, to an extent, I should say. But um, anyway, I was, uh, and yesterday during that discussion, I, I asked myself, um, without the United Nations in the Middle East, and simply without the existence of the United Nations, would the crisis in Syria be resolved much faster, um, or, the existence of the United St of the United Nations does it mean that um, we are mitigating some of the you know toxic effects of of the of, of the conflict in Syria and maybe preventing a spillover into the wider region? So this is a question I can answer, uh, and uh, nobody in, in the room yesterday could answer that question as well. Um, interestingly, the, the panel here asks the question: What can international organizations do in the Middle East instead of uh, why do they fail? Because in order to understand what they can do, we need to understand why do they fail at the moment. Um, speaking, I'll be mostly speaking about the UN uh, here today. And uh, the reason why I think the United Nations is, is failing today is because it emerged as an organization, as a post-Second World War organization, dealing with the problems of the post-war Europe. It was never designed, it was never fit to deal with the problems of the Middle East. It was essentially emerging as an organization in the region that is predominantly, you know, professes the same religion, uh, or no religion at all, like the Soviet Union, right? And the dealing with the complexities of the Middle East, that was certainly not the idea that the, you know, founders of the United Nations had in, had in mind when they were creating this organization. Uh, but going into detail why, why I think the United Nations is failing, um, I think one of the reasons, and we see it now in Syria, is because the state-to-state -state level of interaction uh, is, is essentially very old. It's a 20th century um, concept. You know, we see so many uh, non-state actors emerging in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, in fact, and none of them are being included in this wider framework but when you think about it, and okay, we say, okay, let's, let's include all these non-state actors, uh, paramilitary groups, and work with them through the means of the United Nations, what does it mean? It essentially means that the Westphalian system of, um, has been discussed yesterday and today as well, essentially, you know, the, the Westphalian system um, of international relations, it's just, it just fails, it doesn't work anymore. Because that is the system that establishes the state to state, the state as the primary actor in the international arena. Um, going, I'll, I'll probably since you know you emphasize that I'm coming from Russia, uh, I'll probably go into detail uh, about uh, what Russia thinks about the role of international organizations in the Middle East. Um, just to give you, you know, a, a, an image of Russia in the world today, I would say that the best concept that describes it is a paper tiger. Essentially, it's a power that would like to project this um, superpower image in the world, but it doesn't have much resources to back that image up. Um, Moscow, uh, Moscow in the Middle East today is trying to marginalize the United uh, Nations, the role that the United Nations plays uh, on security issues. Um, Russia disregards the decisions of the United Nations when they contradict uh, its own agenda. And it does so because there's no accountability mechanism, there's no mechanism of enforcing those decisions. Which is why Russia is confident that the United, that the United Nations uh, could be a handicapped body, you know, that is semi-functional when Russia needs it to be functional. Um, but does Russia want the collapse of the United Nations because of the problems in the Middle East? I don't think so. Uh, 
first of all, and uh, John spoke about this, about the technical capabilities of the United Nations of, and of many other bodies within the organization that deal with uh, weapons of mass distraction, with humanitarian issues, peacekeeping, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, I think, to Russia is very important because by its nature, Russia is not a humanitarian actor. Right, and it does need somebody to take over those functions because Russia speaks from the position of power. Um, in Russia's view, the, the the role of the sort of the key players in, in in the global arena should be not dealing with the questions of security in the Middle East. Should not be the international organizations, but rather a narrow group of um, states that have stakes in the Middle East. You know, when you look at the Security Council, not long ago there were so many states that in the Security Council that had nothing to do with the Middle East, but all of them were so opinionated. Um, that is the kind of approach Russia doesn't like, because what, what does Ukraine have to do with the Middle East? Um, nothing against Ukraine here. Um, but um, the reason also why Russia needs the United Nations and the Security Council is because whatever decisions are being made in, in, in an arrow circle, Russia, Turkey, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Russia, Turkey, the United States, all these decisions need to be sold to the international community. And the only way to sell these decisions to the international community is through the United Nations. Um, <coughs> of course, the role of the veto power in the, in the, um, in the Security Council is, is, is an element that sort of reinforces that image of a paper tiger, right? You don't have much power, you can't, you know, compete with the United States in the region, but you have the same veto power, the veto power that, you know, sort of blows your image out of proportions and make you seem very important and very, very threatening at times. Um, the, the mm, and ideally, I think, speaking about uh, Syria, ideally, I think Russia wants to see uh, a grand deal between uh, Moscow and Washington over Syria, not a deal that would be negotiated within the United Nations. And all the processes that are taking place at the moment, Astana process and Geneva, I think these, especially Astana, I think these are the processes that could leave, uh, lead to a, a grand deal between uh, Putin and the Trump administration. Uh, on Syria, uh, but again, the Trump administration is a, is a is a huge variable here. Nobody nobody knows what, why, and how the United States will be uh, dealing with with Syria. Uh, but that's that's the sort of that's the best case scenario for Moscow. You achieve a deal with the United States on Syria, and you sell this deal to the international community through the through the United Nations. Uh, answering the question, why does Russia? why does Russia dislike the United Nations? Uh, it doesn't really that Russia dislikes the United Nations. Um, the problem here is, I think it, you know, it's, it's been a problem for, for many years, starting from 2008, from the Russia-Georgia uh, war. Uh, but the Libya uh, resolution that basically established a, a no-fly zone in Libya, I think that's where the problem started, where Russia felt tricked. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's also a domestic uh, conflict between back then the uh, the, the president, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, and back then Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, sort of a domestic uh, conflict there, it, it was there as well, but essentially Russia felt uh, tricked, it felt that it was, uh, it was not, um, its, its own position on Libya was not taken in, into account, mm, and that's where it all started. You know, there were several resolutions on, on Syria that Russia also uh, did not like. Russia felt marginalized to a large extent uh, during the Geneva process because, and during the, 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 the Security Council discussions on Syria. And so that what step by step led to a decision that, uh, rather to understanding, to a feeling that the United Nations uh, is instrumental at times, but most of the times dealing with the security, the United Nations is going to be an obstacle rather than a facilitator of, of, of decisions. Um, you know, there's also um, an issue of, um, say, Palestine, for example, where the quartet um, also failed and continues to fail, and although Russia is part of the, of the quartet, uh, it feels that dealing with, uh, dealing with Palestine-Israeli conflict on a bilateral level is going to be way more fruitful than, you know, um, rounds and rounds and rounds of discussions and meetings, fruitless meetings. That, this is the reason why Russia keeps bringing Palestinian officials uh, to 
to Moscow, it keeps meeting Israeli officials, and you can basically see how that approach works, because Netanyahu uh, ditches Obama last year and comes to Moscow instead to meet with Vladimir Putin. That sort of approach from the position of power, that's something that works in the Middle East, and Russia sees that you know, mentality, it's sort of something clicked in the mentality here, that uh, this approach that um, uh, Vladimir Putin favors is also the one that you know some powers in the Middle East also opt for. Uh, but I think it was very important uh, in the previous panel um, when it was it was noted rightfully I think that we're in a state of freefall in the Middle East, uh, and that I, th I think is very accurate because international organizations cannot emerge uh, in, in 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 during wars during fighting in the midst of fighting. They emerge as a result of wars, as a result of conflicts, uh, which is why I think you can't really expect much from or bodies like the, the United Nations in terms of uh, um, in terms of security issues at this particular point. The United Nations and other bodies will start evolving after the war in Syria is over, because you know you have you you'll see what what you need to deal with, what what kind of problems you need to tackle in the future. And that's when the United Nations is going to be developing, but not, unfortunately, at, at, at the moment. And you know, as much as I sympathize with, with the people um, in Syria, um, I, I don't think that um, some, somebody here in this room said that Russia hijacked the, uh, the Geneva process. Uh, maybe that would be accurate. Um, and maybe, but I, I think that, that, is, that process of hijacking the, the multilateral uh, approach is probably the only the only effective approach at the moment. Thanks.